You're listening to an Ono Media podcast. Good morning, and thanks for joining me for Rise in Crime, your morning caffeine hit all about crime. I'm Mama Jules, and let's start today with this breaking case out of Arkansas that left one man dead and a father charged with first degree murder. All right, last week, a call was placed with the Lone Oak County Sheriff's Office at about one in the morning. The caller was reporting that a 14-year-old girl was missing. Now, while deputies were on the way to the house to get information about the missing teen, dispatch received another call. This time, the father of the missing teen had found his daughter, but his daughter is in a car with a 67-year-old man. Okay, remember, this girl is just 14 years old. All right, so what's going on here? Well, 36-year-old Aaron Spencer, he's the father of the young girl. He confronted the 67-year-old man, Michael Fosler. And the words exchange have not been made public, but I don't think it's a stretch to imagine that Aaron was furious with Michael. He was so furious, he shot Michael dead. When deputies arrived, they arrested Aaron and determined that Michael had passed. Now we do know this, Michael was not a stranger to Aaron or his daughter. The family had already contacted the law about him and even had a no contact order placed against Michael. That had happened a few months ago. They believe that Michael had raped the teen just months earlier. Now, during that time, Michael was arrested and the no contact order had been established, but he was released pending court hearings. Now, following the shooting, Aaron was charged with first degree murder. In a public Facebook post, just a couple of days after the shooting, A woman named Heather Spencer, who I think we can rightfully presume is Aaron's wife and the young girl's mother, well, she wrote the following. As the sheriff's office and news stations start reporting, I think a few details are super important to note. This man had a no contact order for stalking and raping our child. We absolutely called 911 during the entire event. We had no idea this man was still in contact with our child. He was waiting for six to nine felonies for what he did, not two. He was looking at the rest of his pathetic life in jail, and our daughter was the only witness. We 100% in the moment thought he had taken her to kill her. Some things we will never know, but we know that the police department afforded this predator privacy that they did not give our family, including posting our home address. I'm deeply offended by the way this was handled by the county sheriff's office. Right now, we need to secure a good lawyer to fight these crazy charges. At the end of the day, our daughter is a victim, and we have a long road of recovery for everyone. We are so thankful for all the calls, messages, and prayers. Despite the legal stuff, our family has been through something we don't wish on anyone. Please keep us in your prayers. If you can donate, great, but prayers are holding us together right now. I have been advised that adding my Venmo and Cash App would be helpful, so I'm adding them to my profile. I don't know much about any of this. This wasn't in my plans, so forgive me as I try to navigate it all. Also, Aaron Spencer is home. We were able to post bail this afternoon. Now we need to figure out the attorney stuff. Okay. That was a long post, and Heather is clearly upset about the entirety of the incident. I think that's understandable. And it seems people in Arkansas, well, they're upset too. Community members have generously donated and expressed support for this family, raising over $100,000 by the time I recorded this episode. So much money was raised that the family shut down the donation options, and they're now accepting donations through the gun owners of Arkansas. On the Gun Owners of Arkansas website, they address the tragic incident by writing, This incident is the newest example of use of deadly force that we believe to be justified. Please donate to help this family and others who may find themselves in a similar situation. Now, Heather Spencer has also committed that any extra money that is not used for Aaron's defense will be donated to the Wade Knox Children's Advocacy Center. She wrote on Facebook in a completely separate post, that it seems all the generous donors agree with her and Aaron that children deserve protection. She then asks for continued prayers as they navigate a world that for them will never be the same. Well, at this time, the prosecution and the defense lawyers are not giving statements to the press. And that's not really that surprising. It's very early on in this case. 
But Brian Claypool, who is a California-based attorney who specifically works on child sex abuse cases, told Fox News Digital that Aaron's attorneys have several arguments that could significantly reduce or even eliminate his time behind bars. He said in Arkansas, attorneys can argue a, quote, heat of passion. That defense claims that Aaron would have committed this alleged murder in the midst of an emotional disturbance. If that argument is successful in the courts, it could reduce the first-degree murder charge to manslaughter. Aaron could serve as little as five years if charged with manslaughter and then convicted of that charge. He also said another defense that his attorneys could argue is that Aaron was protecting himself and his family. If they can prove that there was an imminent fear or potential for grave bodily harm to either himself or a member of the family, then the shooting could be classified as justified. This expert also said that the timeline from the first 911 call, reporting that the girl was missing, and then what happened between then and the second 911 call could possibly alter the charges as well. I'll be watching this case. I know you have feelings about this one. Tell me what you're thinking in the comments on YouTube or on social media. And now to an update to a case from 2018 that left an innocent man dead and a woman behind bars for what she called an accidental shooting. Botham Jean was a 27-year-old accountant living in the South Side Flats. That's a four-story apartment complex located in the South area of Dallas. His apartment was on the fourth floor. Also living in the South Side Flats? 30-year-old Dallas Police Patrol Officer Amber Geiger. Conveniently, the Southside Flats are just two blocks away from the Dallas Police Headquarters. Amber had moved to the Southside Flats about two months prior, and the proximity was helping Amber manage her long shifts with less travel. She wasn't new to the force, having just finished her fifth year as a police officer. Amber lived on the third floor in Unit 1378. That's directly below Botham Jean, who lived in 1478. Their units are nearly identical, as most apartment complexes are. Well, on the night of September 6th of 2018, Amber had ended a long 13 and a half hour shift, and she was headed for home at about 9.33 that night. She made the short trek to her apartment complex, and she parked her car on the fourth floor floor of the garage area that happened at 9 45 p.m that fourth floor has no roof above it because it's the top floor of the parking garage so it's just open air amber was chatting on the phone as she parked the car and exited her vehicle amber was still wearing her department issued firearm but she had removed her body camera before heading home as she approached apartment 1478 with her keys out to unlock the door She inserted her key, but the door pushed open without turning the lock. Confused and alarmed, she entered the apartment and saw a man on the couch eating ice cream. Amber pulled her service weapon and fired two shots into the man's chest. Amber hit her target, but she clearly missed some important details. She's on the wrong floor. She's in the wrong apartment. She failed to notice the bright red doormat as she approached with her keys. She failed to recognize that the furniture in the apartment was drastically different. She failed to assess that the man was unarmed. And in her failures, she had mortally wounded Botham Jean in his own apartment, one floor directly above where Amber lived. Amber called 911 at 9.59 p.m. Approximately two to three minutes after firing those two shots. Here, I want you to give a listen to the very beginning of that call. Dallas yeah, on one. This is Carla. Where's your emergency? Hi, this is an um, off-duty officer. Um, can I get? I need Enos. Um, uh, I'm in number. Um, what's your address? Uh, Do you need police okay. as well or just EMS? Yes, I need both. Okay, what's the address? I'm at apartment number 1478. I'm in 1478. And what's the yes. address there? Um, it's 1210 South Lamar. 1478, yeah. What's missed, going on? I missed, I'm an off-duty officer. I thought it was in my apartment, and I shot a guy thinking that he was, thinking it was my apartment. He shot just, someone? Yes, I thought it was my apartment. I'm sorry. 
Oh my God. I'm sorry. Okay, and the, where where are you at right now? I'm in. Uh, what do you mean? I'm inside the apartment with him. From the very beginning of the call, it seems Amber is aware she has entered the wrong apartment. And by her own admittance, she knows she's in trouble. EMS did transport Botham to the hospital, but he died from his wounds. And Amber was arrested and charged with manslaughter three days later. But it was not without outrage. See, there's a couple of things at play here. Amber is white and Botham is black. Botham has moved from St. Lucia. And activists felt the charge of manslaughter was special treatment for the white female officer. But there was more. They couldn't understand why it took three days to arrest Amber, and they were skeptical when it was discovered that the head of the Dallas Police Association turned off the dash camera in the patrol car when he spoke to Amber. Now, Amber said the turning off of the camera had nothing more to do with the case than protecting her as she spoke with counsel. All right, you might be remembering this case. Let's set some things straight. For months, rumors circulated that Amber and Botham were romantically involved. They were not. It is clear now. But rumors about the authorities being divided on their actions concerning Amber, those were true. Some officers felt that Amber hadn't committed a crime. Lead investigator Texas Ranger David Armstrong even testified outside the presence of the jury in Amber's trial that he didn't think she had committed a crime. He instead felt that her actions were reckless and that they fell under criminal negligence. Now, another thing to clear up. Yes, at first, Amber was placed on paid administrative leave. But then, 18 days after the shooting, Amber was fired from her position as a patrol officer. All of this, the pressure, it was mounting. And the Dallas Police Department, in conjunction with the investigation by the Texas Rangers, upped the charge for Amber from manslaughter to murder. One year after the shooting, the trial began. But even that wasn't without chaos. A gag order had been placed on all participants because of the racial tensions and community upheaval. That didn't stop Dallas County DA, John Crizo from taking part in an interview that could have been potentially viewed by jurors who would be questioned the very next morning. The defense filed a motion for a mistrial, but Judge Tammy Kemp denied the motion after clarifying with each juror that they had no knowledge of the interview. All right, this trial was an uphill challenge for prosecutors. Yes, some in the community felt the murder charge was justified, but that also meant the burden of proof was much higher. The DA must convince the jury that Amber intended to kill Botham. One major factor that the prosecution argued was that Amber did intend to kill Botham because she didn't follow standard police protocol and ask for backup. She instead knowingly entered the scene and discharged her weapon. When Amber took the stand in her trial, she testified that she thought Botham was an intruder. She said she'd been confused by him yelling, hey, hey, hey. And during part of her testimony, she sobbed on the stand, saying she asked for forgiveness from God and that she hates herself every single day. Now, her emotions didn't stop the prosecution from delivering tough questions. They asked her why she had no blood on her uniform, implying she hadn't tried any life-saving measures for Botham. They also pressed her about the frantic text messages that she had sent her patrol partner just moments after the shooting, but prior to the 911 call. Those text messages read, hurry, I need your help, I've effed up. They also pressed her about her sexually explicit messages with her patrol partner that had occurred just hours before her shift ended, and also that she parked on the wrong floor and entered the wrong apartment. Well, after just a few hours of deliberation, the jurors found Amber guilty of murder. Activists cheered the guilty verdict, but they expressed anger and frustration over the 10-year prison sentence handed down to Amber. Well, here's the update to this case. It's been five years of Amber serving that prison sentence, which means it's time for the parole board to evaluate if Amber should be released early, only having served half of her prison sentence. Clearly, as this day approached last month, some community members were still raw about the 10-year sentence. More than 6,300 people signed an online petition protesting her release. 
Headlining those 6,300 people were Botham's family members and the Dallas County District Attorney's Office. Well, last week, in a very quick decision, the parole board denied the early release of Amber. An email from the parole department sent to Botham's family acknowledged the criminal victimization that Botham's family had faced due to Amber's actions. CBS News reported that Allison Jean, all right, that's Botham's mother, well, she told the outlet that the family feels a sense of relief by the quick decision, adding that the decision shows Amber must have accountability for her actions. And according to the Daily Mail, Allison, in a prior interview, had expressed that she felt Amber had no remorse for the fatal shooting. Allison cited the various appeals that Amber has filed since the verdict. Those appeals reached the Texas Supreme Court, where they were denied, and then the U.S. Supreme Court refused to take up the case. Allison also expressed gratitude for the many letters and emails that were sent to the parole board opposing Amber's early release. In the parole board statement about the ruling, they wrote the following. Granting parole at this time would undermine the severity of the crime and the justice that was sought through the legal process. This ruling does not mean that Amber can't apply for early release again. That next opportunity will be in 2026. And an update to a case that I brought you on Rise in Crime in the January 25th episode from this year. Here's the highlights from that episode. We're in Grand Junction, Colorado, and some buyers have just purchased a true fixer-upper. On Zillow, pictures of this home show a garbage-strewn, weed-infested property, And there's no interior pics. Probably not the best of indications that this property has been well cared for. Some people, however, crave that low-dollar sweat equity purchase. But the buyers who bought this house, well, they got more than they had bargained for when they started to clean up the back lot of the home. Located on the property were piles of scrap metal and old camping equipment and furniture, and then they found a freezer. Well, the new buyers, ready to get moving on the cleanup, posted online about items that people could just purchase or maybe even pick up for free. And, you know, that's a draw for some people. They might repurpose the stuff or fix and reuse it. Well, that deep freezer was quickly claimed. And when the people showed up to haul away the freezer, they got quite the jump scare. When they opened the freezer, they did that to ease in moving the freezer off their property they discovered a human head. A neighbor named Sam told the local NBC affiliate that the people who stopped by to get the freezer had knocked on his door, begging to use his bathroom to wash up. And sensing something was wrong, he let them in and cautiously asked, what's going on? That's when they told him they had just found a human head. Well, back in January, when I brought you the story, Authorities had yet to unravel the mystery of who and why, whose head and why the freezer. They at least have some of the answers to that mystery now. On Friday, the Mesa County Sheriff's Office confirmed in a press release that the human head and hands that were discovered in the freezer belonged to 16-year-old Amanda Overstreet. Amanda had been missing since 2005. DNA testing of the remains helped investigators solve that portion of the mystery And they did release that Amanda was the biological daughter of previous owners of the home. So we have some more questions to be answered, though. Amanda was never reported as missing. This has me baffled. A 16-year-old vanishes and no one says anything? That's so heartbreaking. And that's where the case ends right now. Authorities have not filed charges against anyone for Amanda's murder, and they haven't said if they've located Amanda's biological parents. They are saying that testing on forensic evidence is ongoing. They're saying they do not have a cause of death, and they're saying that the case is deemed a homicide. Okay, knowing so many questions are still to be answered, the sheriff's office did request that the home where the remains were found Please, they're asking. It's under completely new ownership. It's been completely remodeled. And they're asking for people to not photograph or drive by due to interest in the case. Now, I hope that I can bring you more information on this case soon. I'll let you know when I know. 
And now to this head shaking story out of Louisiana that has one of the fastest jury deliberations that I've ever seen. It took Jefferson Parish jurors under 30 minutes to find 42 year old Jerry Gelpi guilty of first degree murder. Just 30 minutes in a first degree murder case. But you're going to understand after I explain the evidence and details that surround this three day trial. Back in late 2020 and early 2021, 68-year-old Charles Othello Davis was barely hanging on after a nasty case of COVID-19. He had lost 75 pounds battling the virus, and the grandfather of five had been reduced to just 130 pounds after a three-month hospitalization. Now, following the discharge from the hospital, Charles was permanently using oxygen to breathe, and he was basically just struggling with the day-to-day living in his small apartment. On the morning of February 9th, Charles' daughter stopped by his apartment after she had been alerted that her father had missed his scheduled doctor's appointment. She found a bloody and violent scene when she discovered her father stabbed numerous times, dead and in the fetal position in the bathtub. As investigators took over, they learned that Charles had been stabbed at least 16 times in the throat and in his head and neck and in his hands. There were defensive wounds. The bathroom sink had been ripped away from the wall, presumably during the scuffle that led to Charles being stabbed in the bathtub. And then a trail of blood from the bathroom to Charles' kitchen sink led authorities to determine that the killer had washed blood off his hands or possibly even off his body or maybe even the murder weapon in that kitchen sink. Processing both the body and the scene, investigators collected blood samples from the sink and also from under Charles' fingernails. As the DNA was being tested, detectives began canvassing the neighborhood, and that led to an interview with Charles' upstairs neighbor, Jerry Gelpi. Jerry claimed to detectives he had never been inside Charles' apartment. And then he told a tale that Charles would often throw parties at his apartment that included heavy drinking. He's 130 pounds, he's on oxygen, he just got out of the hospital after a three-month stay and he's barely making it to his doctor's appointments? This description of Charles didn't match what the other neighbors were saying, which was that Charles was a quiet man who rarely even had a visitor at his apartment. Now, eventually, Jerry was arrested, and his DNA was matched to that of the DNA found at the scene of Charles' murder. Quickly, Jerry changed his story. His attorneys were now claiming that Jerry was mentally ill, He entered a not guilty by reason of insanity plea at his court hearing. All right, finally, last week during his trial, Jerry took the stand where he identified himself as the son of God. He then said he believed Charles was a demon, the worst kind of demon. And then Jerry pointed at detectives in the courtroom and identified them as demons. He told jurors he was not in control of his body when he killed Charles. The prosecution had some issues with this mental instability claims. They said experts had concluded that Jerry was faking it and that he exhibited no true signs of mental illness other than identifying people as demons. They also contended that a mentally ill person would not take the steps to conceal the crime the way Jerry did. Washing his hands of evidence, throwing the knife in the Mississippi River, getting rid of his bloody clothing. Well, less than 30 minutes after receiving the case, the jury found him guilty of Charles's murder. He now faces a mandatory sentence of life in prison. All right, you guys, you know me. I can't just leave this here. I had to search and try to discover what the fastest jury deliberation has ever been. Do you have any guesses? The answer is one minute. That happened in New Zealand in 2004 when the jury voted to acquit a defendant that had been charged with growing marijuana. Okay, I totally get it in that case. So then that led me to ask, what's the longest jury deliberation? The answer, four and a half months. In 1992, a civil jury in California took over four months to return with a $22.5 million verdict in favor of a woman and her son who sued the city of Long Beach for preventing them from opening a chain of residential homes for Alzheimer's patients. 
And California also has one of the longest criminal jury deliberations. In Oakland in 2003, three police officers who called themselves the Riders were charged with various civil rights violations, such as planting drugs on innocent people and writing false police reports. The jury deliberated for four months before finding the officers not guilty on eight counts, and then they were deadlocked on 27 other charges. Four months in a jury deliberation room. Wow. Now I have to head off and research the writers. Well, that's your Thursday episode of Rise and Crime. Thanks for joining me here on Rise and Crime. I love it. I love doing this podcast. You know it's in my DNA. You know it's in my daughter's DNA. It's just who we are. Remember, we love five-star reviews and positive comments here at Rise and Crime and the other Oh No Media podcast. That's Murder With My Husband and Into the Dark. Please tell a friend about Oh No Media. We love to see our channels grow. And go ahead and like and follow us on social media and YouTube accounts. And you can join me again on Monday for more morning crime news. I'm Mama Jules, and keep safe out there.